Hello and welcome to the MB Om podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hello and welcome to another episode of the MBM Podcast. I'm very excited to announce a new partnership that I have with an awesome company called Ceteris. If you guys have been listening since season two, you might remember an interview that I did with the CEO and founder of Ceteris, Levi Morehouse. It was a fabulous episode where we talked about all things cloud-based accounting, how it affects yoga teachers and yoga studios, and so much more. Since then, we've partnered to offer you a really, really awesome deal. But before I tell you about that, a little bit about Ceteris. Ceteris specializes in accounting for yoga studios and takes care of all of that work for you. We all know that it's really, really important to focus on what we do best. What we do best is teach yoga, and what Ceteris does best is accounting. They give you full access to your financial data and benchmark reporting through their platform. Ceteris Edge, which is built on top of QuickBooks online and integrates with MindBody online. While they offer tax accounting, many other customers also retrain their current CPA and use Ceteris for their month-to-month accounting and benchmark reporting, which their CPAs love. So Ceteris offers a lot of different options for you. They're able to incorporate your platforms that you use with their platforms in order to get you the best results. To learn more about Ceteris's yoga accounting and benchmark reporting solution, please visit www.ceteris.com forward slash MBOM. If you sign up through MBOM, you'll get 50% off your first two months. If you're anything like me, this is a great, great deal because it means that you don't have to deal with your accounting come tax season. So make sure you go over to Ceteris, C-E-T-E-R-U-S dot com forward slash MBOM and sign up for 50% off off your first two months. All right, on to today's episode of the podcast. I am very excited to be joined by Ariane Traverso, who is joining me all the way from Florida. Ariane is the founder of Busy Yoga, as well as the Yoga Expo based out of Miami. And we talk about so much different stuff on this episode of the podcast. We talk about her experience as a yoga teacher, as a yoga business coach, her background in digital marketing, the importance of a sales funnel, and so much more. So without further ado, here's Ariane. All right. I'm very excited to be joined on the podcast today by Ariane, who's joining me all the way from Florida in the United States. Uh, Welcome to the podcast today, Ari. Hi, thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. Yeah, of course. I'm really glad that we're able to connect today. There's so much that I want to talk to you about and learn from you today. Um, But I thought a good place to start would be to back up a couple of years and talk about how you first got into yoga. Awesome. Well, we'll have to do more than a couple years. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I think my yoga journey was very similar to a lot of people's was stepped into a class. You know, my friend was like, Hey, come with me. And I had that moment of what am I doing here? Cause I was never a super sporty person, but I, I was active. Um, and you know, yoga wasn't exactly that we were we were moving. It was, um, the style was the, it's yoga system. And so it was definitely a lot of movement. It just was nothing like I had ever experienced before. So I went to that class and, you know, I sweat so much and got, I couldn't even touch my toes. Let's just, let me backtrack with that. (laughs) I was probably like seven inches away from touching my toes. Wow. So, you know, I, I saw all the other people in class, like doing all these really cool things and handstands. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What is this all all about? I want more. And I just kept coming back, kept coming back. And, you know, a month later, I was totally hooked. I, you know, started hanging out with the yogis and talking about yoga. And, you know, more and more, I just became, you know, not just physically involved with the practice, but the mental, I had never felt that. I've been always like a big thinker and the fact that I think it may be not that first shavasana because I think I fell asleep because the class was so hard (laughs) (laughs) but like the second and third um I felt this peace that I had never really you know and I didn't describe it as peace I think it was just like this feeling I had never felt before and now I could equate it to you know peace and quiet uh so I think that was also really pretty spectacular that you know it changed my life 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I love that. And I feel like I can definitely relate to that as well. Like, I feel like it's so rare in today's society that we find, you know, this place where we can just like lie and it's quiet and it's warm and it feels safe and we can just like really settle into like being still and quiet. Um, and I mean, I, you know, if you practice yoga all the time, of course you get that in Shavasana, but for the average person who has like a really busy lifestyle, when you come to that, it's this like really magical experience. Yeah, fully. And you know, now 15 years later, um, all I want to do is be in Shavasana. I'm like, ah, the asanas aren't as important anymore. I just want to like meditate and chill. Um, but no, I still have my practice, which is great. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's I can fun. also, I can also relate to that. I'm like, wait, when Shavasana, I'm just going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll meet, meet you guys there. <laughs> and so you fell in love with this practice. And at what point did you decide that you wanted to teach? Um, after that, like first like month or so, I took a little break. I moved to Spain to like travel and then I came back and I think it, during my brief stint in Spain, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to, to do. I had a uh, graduated college, uh, with a bachelor of, uh, fine arts, um, with graphics. So I was kind of working in the graphics world while I was in Spain, but not super in love with it. So I came back to Miami and was kind of, I think, subconsciously looking for something else. I had restarted my yoga practice really heavily again. Um, I think at that moment is when I connected with, with my mentor, um, who really guided me to, to really understand like that there's a lot more than just going to yoga class. There's, you know, a whole career that could possibly, uh, arise from this. So I was her assistant. I hadn't really done a teacher training. I was just assisting her a lot. Um, which is originally how, you know, teacher students used to be. There was not a lot of teacher trainings, um, how they are now. And, you know, in India, a hundred years ago, this is how, you know, you learned from your teacher, you assisted them. So she kind of took me under her wing. And one day she calls me and she's like, Hey, Ari, I, um, I don't feel so good. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. She's like, you're going to class tonight, right? I'm like, yeah, of course. She's like, okay, good. You're teaching. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Just go, go teach, teach. You're great. Like, you know, it was Ashtanga. She's like, you know it, you know it, you, you know, you're so good. I was like, okay, I don't know about that, but you know, anything for you. So I showed up and I started teaching and the feeling that I got after that class finished was again, something I had never felt before because being in the graphics world, you know, you kind of work behind a computer. It's not really people driven. Um, so that connection with the students and the adjustments and the energy of me leading was, you know, really sparked my energy. And as a good Gemini that I am, I like to do many things. <laughs> <laughs> and throughout my life, you know, I had um, my parents tell me this all the time. You know, you'd be in ceramics class for three months and then you change. So having that like flighty, um, I want to do everything, the teaching, like it got me. I was like, this is all I want to do. And, you know, a couple months later, I signed up to a teacher training and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, so, I, I love that story. It sounds like I should be a Gemini instead of an Aquarius. That's like totally my personality. (laughs) There we go. We're kindred spirits. Definitely. Um, And I love the fact, too, that you were able to mentor so closely with another yoga teacher. Um, I mean, that is exactly how teaching, you know, came, you know, thousands of years ago. And I think that it's I think that it's amazing the way that the the teaching industry and the way the yoga industry has evolved. But I think that having somebody that you can work with really closely is a huge, huge benefit to being able to learn because like there's only so much you can get out of a group class or like a group demonstration, which is so much of teacher trainings now. Like they're, they're really big usually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I lead teacher trainings and, and honestly, every single training, I always tell my students, I'm like, not, are we just in this group setting? I'm like, just always know that I'll mentor you for life, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever that look like. Um, if you guys want to still come at just in 20 years and show up in my class and Hey, Ari, can I assist? Because there's always something that you can learn. Like I'm always there for them because there's, there's something so special about having, um, like, you know, that mentor, that teacher who, you know, you can rely upon and who you can, you know, kind of just have that special connection with. 
Yeah, um, so yeah, I definitely. Always tell all my graduates, like, please, like, you know, and, you know, I try to keep my teacher trainings like no more than like 15 people to keep that intimacy aspect. Where right. You really can go deep, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. I think that my 200 hour was like 35 to 40 people. And I felt like, I mean, it's not like massive, massive, but it's like big enough that it's really hard to get one-on-one time with the teacher. And like, you know, if somebody asks a question that they're really keen into and it kind of takes it down a tangent, it's like, maybe it's not providing value for the rest of the group. So I mm-hmm. felt like that was a little bit big for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that for sure. But you know, if, if you're still on the path, you know, to, to always be what I call like a teachable heart, there's always an opportunity to find, you know, that one teacher that you're close with or a mentor that, you know, is willing to take you more of that. um, Again, intimate. I like that word intimate um, Mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so you started teaching and um, did you quit your graphic design job at that point to teach full time or what did that look like for you at that point? No, no. Um, as you guys will hear, you know, the, the name of my company is called the busy Yogi and <laughs> for good reason, because I, I love, I love to just do, I'm a, I'm an, I'm a doer of a very like actionable person. So, uh, I, I was working in an advertising agency at that moment. I did quit probably a year later. Um, but kept freelancing, um, I think I, I loved both aspects of my life. What I didn't love was going to a job every day. Um, it was too monotonous for me and, you know, creative person likes to have freedom. So I wasn't free by going to a desk job, but I did love the creativity aspect of, you know, creating, um, campaigns and creating, I worked in fashion photography. So there was that side of me that still wanted to be part of that. So I, I really was able to blend both careers really, really well by having, you know, five to seven yoga classes and then having like two or three freelance clients that I worked for um, at my house in my computer. So I thought that was, um, for me, a really good balance that kind of kept both of my, my cups full. Like I have my purpose cup teaching and, you know, moving people through you know, their practice. And then I have my creative side that, you know, can do all this really cool stuff with the photography and the graphics and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's kind of been like my, my journey as a yoga teacher as well as like not really giving up like the, you know, some of the other aspects of my life that I really, really love and that give me, you know, purpose and meaning in a different way than teaching does. And I think that, I think that as a yoga teacher, it's like, you kind of graduate from teacher training and I feel like it's kind of this really big kind of almost scary world and you've really got to kind of feel out what's going to work for you. Cause I think for some people they want to dive in and all they want to do is teach and they want to just build their career from there. Whereas for other people like you and I, it's like, you know, there's other things that we love doing and it works really well to find a balance between those, those different things. Yeah, for sure. And you know, something that, um, was a big, I think, aha moment for me is that, like, also realizing where my strengths lie. And some of my strengths are very much about, like, activation and motivation and, um, and like, you know, being that leader. But a lot of them are also kind of like the behind the curtains, the planner. So just being in front of, of a classroom teaching all the time uh, also turned into, like, slightly monotonous for me. And... And it's like, no, I want to be like behind my curtain creating, like kind of like the Wizard of Oz, as my friend calls me. She's like, you're the Wizard of Oz. You're just like behind the curtain and you just come up with all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, because that's that's part of my my strength. So knowing that um, and we can you know dive into that a little bit more, because I think that really can make sure that you're happy and fulfilled. Yeah, I love that. I think that sometimes you can come out of, you know, teacher training or come into the teaching world and feel like, oh, you know, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it full time. And I think that, you know, exactly what you said, look at where your strengths are and see where your strengths, where your strengths lie and then kind of roll with that and kind of figure out what, what career is right for you. Cause I think that the amazing thing about being a yoga teacher is that there's so many different routes that you can take with it. There's not just one path where you're like, okay. I teach yoga. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And, um, a lot of my writing has been along that lately of, you know, there's being a yoga teacher is not who you are, 
right? That's not your identity. That's something you do. So going back to like who you are and your purpose and your, you know, being aligned to that is, ah, it's so like so much more full and rich because it gives you possibility and, and options. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So anyways, (laughs) <laughs> like I get all excited. Yeah, no, no, I love it. That's like fully, uh, that's what I love. So I'm, I'm down with your excitement. Um, and so do you still work in the freelance industry? Do you still do graphic design, advertising, photography, any of that type of stuff? Or have you shifted away towards your yoga business? Um, I don't really do graphic design anymore per se, unless it's for my own stuff, um, which is a great skill to have. <laughs> Definitely. Um, <laughs> What I've moved into probably the last couple of years is, you know, it's the aspect of, of building sales funnels and digital marketing, um, which uses like my strategic brain a lot. So the minute I, I think I, I hit, I hit a wall. I did. I hit a wall with, with teaching. Um, and I was, I had opened a yoga studio. So I owned a, a fairly successful yoga studio here in Miami, um, for five years um, with some great business partners. And in that time, I think is when my, my business brain like turned on more because before I was investing a lot of my time and energy into taking more yoga trainings. I mean, I'm probably, I don't know. I have way, way too many certifications to like even count, but (laughs) you know, everything was going into learning about yoga and meditation and, and acro yoga, um, acro yoga teachers. So, um, I had let go of a lot of the necessary skills to run a business and I opened this massive business. So my, a lot of my attention shifted into what it takes to having a successful business and, you know, pricing and strategy and marketing. And, you know, I knew a lot about that because of, I don't know, I think I've just, I was born an entrepreneur, but I really dove deep into maximizing this and taking business trainings and, digital marketing trainings. And, you know, it, it was so complimentary to what I was doing um, that little by little, my like shift, uh, my attention shifted to wanting to learn more about that. And then that's when I created Busy Yogi is because um, I saw this a lot. Like as yogis, we want to like, like go deeper and deeper into a yogic studies. But then if you're trying to run a business like I was, you know, I had a my monthly, you know, expenses having a 17 person staff, you know, in a super high traffic area of Miami, you know, we're we're like ridiculous. I had gone from teaching classes, running retreats, um, to then having this like massive, you know, enterprise. So I realized that, you know, Hey, like I need, I need certain skills and, now I love these skills that I've learned. Like I love building sales funnels. It's weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, so I shifted from teaching weekly classes to teaching trainings, workshops and immersions, um, and retreats. So that's, that's where like my teaching is now, just like on the, on the bigger events, um, less on the day to day. And then because of this business that I've built, which is the mentoring for business, I, I fell in love with digital marketing. So I've been doing a lot of that lately and designing, like I said, not just funnels, but strategy and um, kind of coming up with branding. So, so I've like fused everything because I work with yoga teachers who, you know, want to start their own businesses and I fulfill my purpose, which is still, you know, the branding, the graphics, just strategizing, consulting more versus actually doing them. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I love that too. That sounds like a a really interesting shift to have made. Um, I'm curious from your time owning this like super busy, um, big yoga studio, what are some of the biggest things that you learned? To stay humble because I had to clean a lot of toilets during that time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, stay, stay humble. And I know that it's owning a yoga studio is a community based work right? It's all for your students. Um, so to just kind of let go and just focus on their needs. Um, that was probably one of the the biggest things that helped me like stay not only, you know, happy during being the owner of it or co-owner, but, um, so it was like focusing on, on their needs, 
apart from just like giving a really good class, it's like, you know, what kind of programming do they like? Um, what kind of retail do they like? You know, um, are they happy with the facility? So having like a broader vision versus like, uh, I just need to get my tasks done, you know, cause again, like think if you're teaching a class, you go in, you teach your class and then you leave. But if you are, you know, so there, so there, maybe there's no like bigger vision, um, like large scale, but when you have, you know, this studio that's full of people, then you have to really focus on, you know, their needs from a low level to a high level. Then second was my staff. How can I support my staff? I never had staff before. Everything was a one woman show. So now having a staff of not just a bunch of yoga teachers, but front desk, a manager, um, accountant, you know, really allowing that staff to do their job and not micromanage so much, especially us control freaks. <laughs> <laughs> so I think also that was trust, trusting others was a really big thing. And, and also self care because owning a larger scale business like that, you might, well, I got lost. I got lost in the work. I got lost in the trying to do everything. And I kind of wasn't even that happy anymore because I wasn't taking care of myself. Like I didn't take vacation. I took work trips, you know, there were, there were such high expenses that I was scared to invest back into myself because I was like, Oh, what if we need something, you know, for the studio? So, so it was, it was stepping out of like fear and stepping into like making sure that I was taken care of as well. Um, I thought that was a really big thing. Yeah. That's one of the things that I've heard actually the most from studio owners is like, I mean, you just become, I think, so full on into this business and you're, you know, like you said, you're focused on your students because at the end of the day, it's about your students having a really great experience at your yoga studio and it can become like all of a sudden you forget that you've like attended to your students and you've totally forgot to like attend to yourself. And it's hard to be a good yoga teacher and a good yoga studio owner when you haven't take care, taken care of yourself first. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. I remember like one of the last, like the last couple months we were open um, I like stepped back in to make sure that our closing process, cause I, we hired a manager and it was great. But at the end, like I was like, all right, I like owner responsibilities come in. And there were a few days that I was there like 12 hours a day. And I was like, this is not healthy. <laughs> it is not good. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, I'm going to just set up a cot in the back and just sleep here because <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. just <laughs> like save on rent to live in your yoga studio. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, not a good, not a good move. <laughs> this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Fave Yogis. Fave Yogis is the newest yoga app designed specifically with yogis in mind. It was built out of Santa Monica, California by a practicing yogi and software engineer from MIT. Fave Yogis connects yoga students with their favorite yoga teachers through a simple to use app that is free to download. Teachers can post one-time events like workshops and retreats, as well as regular weekly classes, and students can easily find teachers' offerings from anywhere in the world. As I mentioned, it is free to download, so you can head on over to the App Store on any Android or Apple device, download Fave Yogis for free, and get started today. When you sign up, make sure you enter code MBOM, MBOM, and make sure they know I sent you. And so you got out of this yoga studio business and is that when you decided to start running, you know, your bigger programs, open the busy yoga yogi and start working as like a mentor for other yoga teachers? No, I decided to do that while I had the yoga studio. Um, <laughs> it's, the, it's the Gemini. <laughs> it's the Gemini. Um, there was, I, I, I had a moment during the, the studio ownership that I didn't feel like I was in my purpose. Um, I had taken a, a strength finder uh, test called wealth dynamics. Mm -hmm. And in wealth dynamics, I ended up being what's called a creator mechanic star. Okay. And I'll, I'll give you a brief explanation. So creator, you guys can imagine, right? I like to create uh, mechanic. I love to figure out how to do things and how to improve the way things are, are, you know, are done. So it's like efficiency to the max and, and systems and strategies. And then star was kind of like, you know, being the star of the show, like an Oprah type person. 
Um, so, of course, my creator brain, I was like, okay, I've had this studio for four years. Great. Let's do something else. This is running great. You know what I mean? So I decided to open Busy Yogi during that time because I had a feeling that, I don't know, there was something that wasn't like jiving um, in the studio. I, we had a we had issues with our landlord. There was just like a, like a few things that I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Like something doesn't feel right. So me being also like precautious, I <laughs> I was like, let me add another revenue stream just in case. That was mine, right? Remember, I own the studio with two other people. So Busy Yogi was mine and 100% mine. So that also kind of made me re- be back in like the driver's seat of my own business. So yeah, I opened it while the studio was running. And, and luckily, because, you know, we decided to, to close the studio a few months later and I was like, great, I already have a, a business that's working. And, and it it was still aligned with what I wanted. You know, we had been running teacher trainings at the studio. So I had a captive audience. I, you know, I've been teaching in Miami for 15 years. So I, I had a huge network of support. So there were a lot of things in my favor that allowed me to not have to be able to give up on one to start another. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also a really hard worker, so I and a, and I work. I try to work as smart as possible, so it, it wasn't hard for me. You know, it wasn't like oh, I need to give up this in order to create this. It, it just kind of flowed into each other, which was really nice. Yeah, I think you touched on a couple like really important things there. I think that one is like trusting your gut always. Like it sounds like you kind of had you know, almost this like intuitive, like, okay, you know, something's not feeling right about this. And I need to like, make sure that I'm set up, you know, with my own career, like putting yourself first in that. Um, and then also having, you know, multiple revenue streams. I think it's, it's something that I've heard time and time again, especially in the yoga industry. I mean, you know, if you're a yoga studio owner, there's a lot of different like variables, like your landlord could like tell you you have to leave at any point. Um, something could happen with the economy, but then also as a yoga teacher, like not only having all your classes in one studio, because if something happens with that studio, that's like all of your work as well. Right. Right, right. And I think from, you know, even before I opened the studio, I I think somebody told me it's better to have one egg in a hundred baskets than a hundred eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like really took that to heart. (laughs) (laughs) And so when I, when uh, I started working with my business coach, um, you know, she's like, okay, Ari, let's just like sit down and go through your revenue streams. I started like listing, listing, and she's like, oh my God. And I was like, hey, you know, just in case. And, and, and it also gives you a choice because it's like, well, you know what? I don't like right now. I'm like, I don't really want to teach weekly classes anymore. But if that had been a hundred percent of my like revenue, then imagine you're like stuck doing something that you don't want to do anymore. And what happens when, you know, when mm-hmm. you hit that, it's called unhappiness. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. There's that. And then there's also like, what happens if you get injured or you want to take vacation or like, you know, like say you, I don't know, are out skiing, which you're probably not doing in Florida, but say you're, no. <laughs> or like even running or something like that, like accidents can happen at any moment. And when you're in the business of using your body for work, I mean, that yeah. can be really bad if you don't have any other revenue streams. Exactly. Um, and then I was introduced to the theory of like trading time for money and that's all I have been doing. Mm-hmm. You know, if I was there teaching, I wasn't making money. So, you know, talking to this free spirit that I love to travel and I love to like, you know, I'm trying to fill up my passport as quickly as possible. <laughs> I, I feel goal. that <laughs> I have three pages left. <laughs> I have two years to do it. It'll get done. You got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I got it for sure. So imagine, right, I was having this like almost existential crisis being like, well, I want to take three weeks off. I was like, wait, but I can't live not working for three weeks. Mm -hmm. So the idea of like passive revenue of, you know, all these ideals that you're like, oh, one day. I was like, no, not one day. Now. Like, how do I make it now? (laughs) So that's when I think a lot of um, my little eggs that I had been putting in these baskets started making more sense and I I was like well how can I unite these how can I make them you know one egg like help the other egg so I really started connecting the dots and 
so far so good. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. If there's somebody out there listening who, you know, maybe is working full time as a yoga teacher right now and primarily teaching studio classes, maybe some like workshops and privates and stuff on the side, but they're listening and being like, okay, I really need to like have some other revenue streams and maybe some that can like in the future be passive, some passive income for me. Do you have any like pieces of advice for where to start with that? Yes, I would definitely go back to your strengths. Remember I said we'd talk, talk about that. Mm-hmm. Go back to your strengths. Um, what do you love to do? I always you know, tell my clients, if you could wave a magic wand and close your eyes and just create the perfect day, what would you want to spend that day doing? If teaching is number one, then what would be number two, right? So because everything that you think is totally doable, right? So first we, we need to know that that anything you set your mind to is doable. Second, so find your strengths. If you're a creative person, would you want to spend your day writing? Would you want to spend your day um, filming videos? Would you want to spend your day like taking people on nature hikes? Right? I don't know. (laughs) That's for you to figure out. Um, So leveraging those strengths to then create either what's called like a product of some sort. Um, That could be writing a book. That could be being a speaker that could be um creating your own clothing line it there's so many options so the business model should fit your lifestyle versus your lifestyle fitting your business model does that make sense yeah yeah Um, definitely okay so if you're looking to create something else other than what you're doing now figure out what lifestyle you want to have and then see well what else could support that vision right could support the 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 long term which is, like I said, something that doesn't involve you having to be there constantly. Um, The solution is not getting a second job. The solution is, what do I love to do? Now, how do I get it done? And if the how part is the hard one, then that's where like people like myself or Amanda, right? There's a lot of us out here who have the strategies, the systems, the know-how of how to to get you there. Um, But definitely it's the bigger vision and harnessing your strengths to then create that part B. Yeah, I love that. I think that there's a lot of like, oh, follow this formula and you'll have, you know, your side hustle in five days and stuff like that kind of like floating around on the internet. But I I really like the idea that there's no like one right way to create your other revenue streams. And it's really about like, what can you offer based on what you're good at? Like, what is your unique thing that you could create a product or a service out of? Yes. And, and I thank you for like mentioning that. Cause you know, now in the world of Facebook ads, it's like, you know, just do this one thing or da 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 and you know, six figures. And it's like, no, dude, no, you know, <laughs> maybe for a couple people out there, but let's be real. And let's like, let's listen to, to all our teachings as yogis, right? Practice will take you, you know, down a journey. And that practice is not one day to the next. And I know like as Westerners, we love instant, but instant doesn't always mean quality. Definitely. So yeah. If you want to create something that's quality, then take your time. Don't, don't live in like analysis paralysis, but take your time to make sure you're doing it right, that you're following, you know, a system or steps, but towards your bigger goal. And that goal looks very different for many people. And the steps are going to look very different towards that goal. So, you know, again, it's, it's not getting lost in like, Oh, I need to do this tomorrow. It's like, let's start tomorrow or start today to see something come about. That's quality. That's going to be, you know, aligned to, you know, to your soul, to, to, to your values as a yogi. Yeah, definitely. I I couldn't agree with that more. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And so you were talking about how, you know, you're very passionate and interested in digital marketing and sales funnels. And I feel like that's an area that a lot of yoga teachers are not so knowledgeable in, one may say. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I don't want to make a big stereotype, but I think that's fairly true. Uh, (laughs) No, I like, I love digital marketing and sales funnels as well. Maybe not as much as you, but definitely something I'm interested in. And I I see a lot of value in it as well. Um, I'm wondering if you can share some of your key things about sales funnels and digital marketing that, you know, yoga teachers can learn from. 
Yeah, for sure. So first of all, if you have a product that you want to sell, right, and product could mean from a pair of yoga pants to your next yoga retreat to your teacher training, we want to take our potential customers on a journey. And that's where the sales funnel comes in, right? This is where we kind of allow people to learn about us through sales copy to get engaged by um, effective call to action. Um, they get, you know, indoctrinated, I want to say, into the culture that you're trying to create. And a sales funnel can be two pages. It could be an opt-in, right? Like give me your email. The world of email marketing is still alive and thriving. So it could be just that simple opt-in. And then the second thing could be, you know, having a really intricate, like five, seven page funnel where you're, you know, selling people into a program, but then they're like, Oh, I don't want that program. And then, you know, uh, something else comes up with like an upsell or a downsell. So it's really taking people through a purchasing journey. And I know the word like sell or purchase or buy sometimes in, in like our yogi hearts doesn't make sense because we're like, no, I don't want to sell anything. You know, you're selling yourself constantly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> like I don't want it to sound weird, but as yoga teachers, it's like, well, how are people going to go to your class? Right? Because you're telling them to. So that's a call to action to just put it very simply. So sales funnel is your digital call to action. It's like, come, come take my class, come read my book, come to my retreat, learn about my teacher training. And that could be like with videos, with like, um, you know, testimonials. It could be with a lot of stuff that represents you. So you don't have to be out there, um, you know, talking to people every day. You can have this digital piece working for you. Now, most likely you need, you need some traffic, right? You need people to look at this sales funnel. I always, everybody's like, oh, Ari, I need to make my website beautiful. I'm like, well, who's looking at your website? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, so why are you going to spend so much money making this beautiful website when nobody's seeing it? So it's really, it's also like backtracking and building your tribe right before that. Mm -hmm. um, and sales funnels just save you time. You know, they're like the smart way to sell your products online, products and services. Yeah, definitely. I love that. And if somebody's like, you know, in teaching like regular classes and they've got this website with maybe some offerings on it um, and they need to get, get traffic. Like, what do you feel like is the best way to get somebody to find your offerings online? Um, I think there's definitely, you know, everybody thinks like Facebook ads. Um, that's one way, you know, and that we can all pretty much like access this fairly easily. But apart from Facebook ads, you could do Facebook lives and send people. You could be a speaker at a live event and send people to your website. You could have a Pinterest board. I mean, there's, again, there's so many different ways that, you know, people can find you without having to spend a ton of money. Like I built most of my business without running any Facebook ad. Um, I, I put together a summit called the Business of Yoga Summit. So I had a ton of speakers also help me promote my summit, my website, my everything. So joint ventures, a great way to let that, um, to let your, you know, your tribe grow. Yeah. I love that idea. It's, you know, just finding, you know, your people on the internet, engaging with them. Cause I feel like once people can get to know you, once they know that you exist, if you have something that's like authentic and interesting to offer them, then they're going to become engaged. It's like actually finding those people and being like, hi, I exist in this world. Like check out, check out what I do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that that's all like really, really great, great stuff. Um, and I think that once people are able to find you, you know, they can really connect with the things that you're offering. I love the idea of doing something that's a little different than Facebook ads. Cause I feel like it's the one that you hear the most often these days. Um, like finding yeah. ways to engage people. Like if you're looking to build an online community with Facebook live or, you know, finding ways to be in front of people, um, whether or not that is in the studio offering workshops, maybe finding like local community events where you can speak or like host, you know, I don't know, a meetup or, you know, somewhere where people can talk yeah. about food or something like that, like something that's outside of yoga, yeah. but still connected. Yep, exactly. And, and I, I really think one of my favorite ones is that joint venture. It's like, who else has a tribe of people that would be interested in what you have to say? Right. So it's like, 
is there a publication that maybe you write for or that's another way of, of getting yourself out there, like contributing, you know, the more I, and I don't want this like word to be thrown around a lot, but the word value, like, you know, I, I talk to a lot of coaches, a lot of speakers and everybody's like value, value, but it's true. Like how much value can you provide to, to an audience, right? That they would be like, that they'll take that second step and click on your link or, you know, book a session with you. Oh, definitely. So, I think that providing value is massive. Like, and people will be able to clearly see if you're providing the value or not, like pretty much right away. Right away. All right. That's why I said it's not about like how quickly we do it, but it's like how well we do it. It's that quality aspect. Yeah, definitely. I think that quality over quantity is always an important lesson to learn. Yeah. It's, I think yeah. it's, it's hard in the world of social media. I think it's really easy to look on, on Instagram and be like, oh, well, you know, I don't have, you know, 30,000 followers or a hundred thousand followers or something. So maybe I should just like give up on what, on what I'm doing, but you know, having 500 or 1000 or even 50 people who are super, super interested in what you have to offer is more important than having, you know, a bunch of people who maybe don't actually care about you. Yeah, That's so true. And you know, there's, um, he's a, he's a, he's an amazing coach. Uh, his name's Frank Kearns. I don't know if you know him, but so Frank Kearns, somebody wrote him, well, you know, if you're so good on social media, why don't you have, you know, a hundred thousand followers? And Frank replied, he's like, last time I went to the bank, I tried to take my 50,000 followers and they wouldn't let me deposit them. <laughs> like, so it's like, you know, I mean, I think this applies to anything, you know, if, if you don't have, if you haven't invested the last five years building your Instagram following, then and, and you were like, well, I need to have a hundred thousand followers to be heard. So then you buy a hundred thousand followers. Like, is there integrity in that? Probably not. Right. So, and you know, those followers are worth nothing. It's just a number for you to show. Right. Um, so it's, it's about being authentic. Like I don't have, four, you know, I have what, like almost close to 3,500 followers, but that's not my, like, that's not where I put my time and energy. I put my time and energy into building other kinds of relationships. Um, so, you know, I think we have to pick and choose where we put our energy and how well we're going to do it. Yeah, definitely. I love that. I think that that's another thing for people to remember too, is like, you can never put, well, I mean, I guess you could in, in theory, put your energy into all these different platforms and all these different places. But I think it's a lot more effective to pick a couple different places where your audience is really engaging with you, where your people are, where your tribe is, and really focus in on that. And if, you know, Instagram's not the place for that, then that's fine. If it is, on the other hand, you know, that's great too. invest your time in doing exactly. that and building them. But right. Yes. Fully, fully, fully knowing your client, knowing where your people are, and then trying to connect with them wherever they are. <laughs> like, Definitely. Oh, I know that, you know, the girls that I love to work with love to knit. Well, let me join a knitting club. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Make yourself some, uh, some new mitts, which you also don't need in Florida. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Send them up to me in Canada. <laughs> one, one day of winter we get. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> And so you also have, I mean, you have lots of cool stuff going on with your business, but you also have yoga expo. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yes. Oh, super cool. So I'm very excited to, um, I just became, um, one of the owners of the yoga expo and it's basically, um, a yoga conference meets trade show. Um, so it's a one day event. We have them in different cities. I run the one here in Florida. And basically it's over 50 classes. It's actually like 95 classes. That's what we're putting on the schedule. It's all day. So it's at a convention center. And we also have a lot of really cool vendors that, you know, with brands that are aligned to yogic values. So we get to highlight not just, um, you know, anywhere from small to mid-sized companies and give them an audience and a platform, but we also get to highlight our local community. So we bring, you know, all the teachers in South Florida together. Um, I have teachers applying from really all over the United States, but you know, we're really creating this platform for you know some of the the stars that we have here that don't get access to 150 people in a classroom setting. So it's like yoga festival meets conference meets trade show. Um, yeah, and I was a I was a teacher at the last one. 
And it was awesome because I had, you know, over 120 people in my classes and it gave me a lot of um, access to new students. It allowed me to also be a speaker. I did, you know, I, I did a business of yoga talk that got me like some really great clients. So I was able to, you know, harness like the power of community to not just grow my business, but now I get to help other teachers grow their business. And something that I'm doing a little different this year is because I am a business coach, uh, a business mentor, it's what I actually like to call myself. Um, all the teachers that are participating, I'm going to give them like a free course, one of my courses, um, or something just to also get them excited about um, how to leverage, you know, this yoga conference to then help them grow their businesses. Yeah, so that's amazing. Re- re-inspiring me a little bit. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I get to do more. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. What are some of the biggest things that you've learned through the Yoga Expo, both like teaching at it and offering a talk and also just, you know, running it this year? Um, well, teaching at it, uh, I think definitely was like, I got everybody's email, you know, I was like, oh, well, how do I stay connected here? Give me your email. Um, so that was the first thing I did or the last thing after my class. Um, you know, I made sure I stuck around, had, had conversations, invited people to, you know, um, to be part of my, not just my email list, but like really part of my tribe. Um, so I think like making sure that you take the time to learn people's names and to, you know, reconnect with them throughout the day. It was really important. And then now as the owner, I'm, well, I'm learning so much. (laughs) I've never run a huge event like this. You know, I run, I run retreats and trainings, but a huge event like this with so many logistics, um, really made me step up my organizational game. And as a creative person, sometimes we tend to not be the most organized. (laughs) Um, so like just making sure I also, um, contact the right people and come from a place of service. Like, I still feel like that is huge, even though I'm, you know, just talking to somebody that wants to sell their jewelry at the show. Like, it's like, how can I serve you? You know, I know this is the bigger event, but like, apart from just giving you the space and you giving money for it, like, how else can I, you know, facilitate your growth in your company? Um, and then just listening to, to, you know, people's concerns about the last couple of years when I wasn't running it. So kind of being attentive to not make the same mistakes that, you know, were that we had. For example, I know last year the rooms were really full. So this year I'm going to, you know, strategize a little bit so that we don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I feel like, you know, listening to people's feedback is like, I mean, one, it makes people feel like they're actually heard because so often feedback is asked for and then it's like not implemented. And it's kind of like, well, why did you ask me my opinion if you weren't going to do anything with it? And it just like, like it improves the experience as well. Like if, you know, there's 50 people in a 35 capacity room, it's uncomfortable for the practitioner. So it's like, how can we make it more comfortable for the people who are coming to have this great experience here? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you know, like, I feel like the, the yoga world is not just, let me, let me rephrase that. I know the yoga world is not just asana. Um, so I'm bringing in a lot more of like mindfulness meditation. So if people last year, you know, didn't have space in a classroom that they were trying to jam, like people doing power yoga in, well, guess what? That's turned into the meditation room. (laughs) So we could fit more people and like have like a nice quiet space. So like just being a little bit more creative also with the scheduling um, and and I'm adding lecturers because I know last year it was just like movement, 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 movement. It's like, well, let's go sit and like learn something and take some notes. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was also kind of cool, you know, just listening, listening uh, in, in many different ways, you know, listening with my eyes last year, listening with my ears from what happened um, and then listening with my intuition. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think the first time I went to a Wanderlust festival, I was actually really surprised by how many like yoga talks and, um, all these other things that they had going on that were not, you know, the practice of like, you know, asana or meditation. And I actually really love the idea of incorporating all this other stuff because I think that when you embody yoga as a lifestyle, you learn that there's so many different elements to it. And, you know, having conversations about, 
you know, the environment or maybe the food that you eat or, you know, the other practices in your, in your day? Like, how can you be mindful when you're right. in at the grocery store and there's, you know, a bunch of people in line and the person who's checking them out is really, really slow and there's a baby behind you screaming and you kind of <laughs> just want to like throw in the towel. <laughs> You know, you'd like, how can we bring mindfulness to those moments? Yes. <laughs> First world problem. <laughs> oh, at its finest. <laughs> I can buy any food from all over the world in any season, yet I'm upset because the line is moving too slow. Baby screaming. Yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, that's, that's part of the mindfulness. You know, it's, it's taking the values from your mat and into every single aspect. You know, like I'm married and... I have an amazing, um, you know, partnership with my husband because we have a lot of these values that, you know, he's a yogi too. So not as much as me, which is cool. Uh, but you know, we have this like common ground of, you know, stuff that like we went to yoga the other day together and I was like, look, see all this cool stuff that you learned, blah, blah, blah. And, and it, it just really creates an environment for just harmony, which is so nice. So everybody who's listening, harmony. Take those values from your mat and into every single part of your life, including your business, mainly in your business, because you want to do business with integrity and with authenticity. So just, you know, and I teach, that's how I, I, I mentor. I use yogic values and how can we put them into every single part of your business, even if it's your digital marketing. Totally. I love that. What are some of the biggest ways that you feel like people can bring harmony into their business? I'm going to go back to that word to to values and authenticity. Mm -hmm. You know, don't pretend to be somebody you're not. Don't, um, you know, don't try to over, over promise and not deliver. Um, because then you're going to get, you know, um, fluctuations with your clients. Um, if you're, you know, if you have a, a company, like make sure that that company has some really solid values that you'll stand for. Trust me, like having good values will grow your business. Like having something that you're really like staunch and that you're are non-negotiables will grow your business because people will like align to that. You know, they're like, Oh man, that girl, like she really loves orangutans and she'll do anything for the orangutans. I love orangutans too. Like I'm with her. Yeah. You know, I, funny example. Um, <laughs> that was a funny example, but I mean, it's very true though. Like, especially like that example is one that's like, people will do anything for the orangutans. So yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying, <laughs> you know, but like one of, um, you know, somebody that, that I learn a lot from like him and his wife, they build schools in Africa and they're like, you know, if, if you want to be part of our tribe, like know that we're going to ask stuff of you and it's going to go to building schools in Africa. And if you don't like that, like, you don't have to be part of our tribe, you know, like we don't work on Sundays because we're with our family. So if you need something from me, please respect that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's listening. It's listening to, to yourself, to your heart, to your values, and then making sure that that's communicated. So when you have clarity in the communication, that's harmony right there. You're not, you know, people aren't trying to figure stuff out. And I learned that the hard way. Like I remember when I first opened my business, Busy Yogi, I didn't have a lot of like, um, rules and like contracts set into place. So like people who were like joining my course and I was like, Oh, Hey, by the way, like you're done. They're like, what do you mean? I'm done. Like there was never anything telling me that I wasn't done. And I was like, Oh man, oops. Yeah, you're right. I'm so sorry. So that, you know, like just making sure you have your processes, your operating procedures that are clear, the way you communicate with your people is clear. And again, it doesn't have to be in a coaching way. It could be, you know, from a training you lead, or from a product you sell, it's just always good to like be transparent and be like, this is, this is it. This is what you get, you know, like all of me plus here's all the supporting stuff that you might need. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That actually just makes me think of, um, my 200 hour yoga teacher training. It was very much framed as like, okay, it's this teacher who like runs this training and it was a, a four week intensive and we got there and that teacher wasn't there for the first two weeks which was fine. Like there was other great faculty that were teaching us, but it just felt like a little bit of the advertising was slightly misleading. And I was like, I think you would be better off if you promoted your other teachers, like advertise the other awesome teachers that you have on your staff and just be really right. honest about how this is going to go for four weeks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just transparency and clarity. And, and, you know, again, like making those mistakes already 
it's like, oh, I know not to do that again. You know, so it's okay to kind of like make the mistakes, but learn from them and then improve <laughs> right away. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <Right> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's key. Like, I feel like people are very forgiving when you make mistakes, as long as it's not this mistake that you're like, you know, doing over the course of a couple months or you continue to repeat. It's, it's learning from this mistake and then implementing something different, like looking at it and being like, well, that clearly didn't work. Like this person is unhappy or it didn't work for them. Like, how can I change that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Are there any other business lessons that you've learned through your career that you want to share with listeners today? Um, allow yourself to cry once a month. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but kind of like, you know, uh, and it goes both ways, like celebrate the small success and like allow yourself to kind of, you know, have your moments where you need to let it out. And, you know, men can cry as well. Um, I think that is really good, but those crying moments, like don't stay down on the ground, just pick yourself right back up. It's like, okay, I had my catharsis and let's keep moving. Starting your own business is a lot of moving pieces, whatever business. Okay. So building the right. Yeah. Like sometimes being one person show is not going to get where you need and it's going to build frustration and overwhelm. So allow yourself to ask for help or needed, um, learn, learn and keep learning and then learn a little bit more, but, but don't stay learning mode, learn and act, learn and act. Right. I think that's huge. And then have fun, <laughs> make sure whatever you're doing brings you pleasure and joy. It's not just about like the money and like getting the business and blah, 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 because then it becomes, you know, dreary. So have fun, have fun in your business, like smile and make sure that you you know, get the massage when you need it and, you know, take a day off and go on vacation. Everybody understands like people need a day off. Don't feel bad about like taking care of yourself. Um, and then I think the biggest one, apart from having fun and letting yourself cry, uh, <laughs> is, um, it's just like, see, keep your vision, keep your vision for the long, the long haul, you know, because that vision is, is your center. And there's going to be different ways to get to that vision. Be flexible. Um, you know, I know like, you're like, oh, maybe I'll try this. Oh, well, you know, that didn't work so much. Well, don't just get stuck and like, oh, it's, you know, I'm done. I'm doomed. This didn't work. Well, how else can I get there? What other road can I build? Oh, does that road need to get paved? Oh, well, the pavement's expensive. What else can I use? Be really resourceful. I think for me, like that's been a keystone for, for my business is being thoroughly resourceful and asking the right questions and not being afraid to reach out to, to mentors, you know, like I offer a free phone call. So you're going to get a lot out of that free phone call. Um, just, you know, because I know that I, I needed that. So, so yeah, it's, it's ask the right questions and don't be afraid, like step up, you know, it's so what if it doesn't work, there's something else afterwards. Yeah, no, I love that. All that stuff is so great. I love what you said about keeping your vision and being flexible about getting there. I think that it's like sometimes we have this picture of what we want in our minds and we start doing it. We hit roadblocks and it's like, oh, well, that didn't work. So maybe I'll just like have a new career now. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, if you really want something, that's not the way to get it, right? It's not going to just be handed to no. you on a silver platter. Like you're going to have to work for it and you're going to have to, you know, find ways to navigate around those roadblocks. And like you said, be resourceful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that those are all key. So yay. Amazing. <laughs> so if people want to learn more about your business, if they want to book a phone call with you, if they want to find you online, where they, where can they go to find all that information? For sure. Um, so I, the two easiest ways is one, my website, which is busy yogi, B I Z Z Y yogi.com. And then I have a great, uh, Facebook group. It's free. It's called yogi hearts business minds. So you can always find me there as well. And if you want to book a call on my website, there's um, a button called work with me. And there's several ways. So you can pick one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm really accessible. You can just shoot me an email or, you know, find me on Facebook. Like I said, um, I answer very quickly and I love what I do. So if, you know, you have an idea and you're just like, well, I don't know how to do it or does it even make sense or am I crazy? Like you're not crazy. Have a talk with me. We'll figure it out. 
I love that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And thanks for this great conversation today, Ari. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, I'm glad we met and thank you for the platform as well. So if, you know, back to the question, how do you reach people? Talk to people who have podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And ask, hey, can I be on your podcast? Yes, great. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, I think it's a lot easier than people, people think in their minds that it is. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Amanda. I really had a great time. I hope to speak to you again. Yeah, you too. All right, guys. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast with Ariane Traverso from Busy Yogi. Make sure you go and check her out on social media, with her website. She's got lots of awesome stuff happening and lots of great resources for all of us yoga entrepreneurs out there. As always, you can find more notes and links on everything that we talked about over at the show notes at www.mbomyoga.com. You can find me on social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga on Facebook and Instagram. And I would love to invite you to join our private Facebook community called Yoga Business Badasses. You can just search it on Facebook and ask to enter and I'll let you in. I would love to have you there. As always, thanks so much for listening and namaste.